Dear Lord, thank you for this event. Thank you for everyone who's able to come, and uh, we pray for the people who wanted to come but were not able to. Please open our minds and our hearts to the truth of your word. Please be with the teacher and help him to expound rightly, and uh, may we be blessings to each other tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, well, I guess uh, since we're here to study the Bible, let's open our Bibles, and let's go straight to... Uh, Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 33. Uh-oh. Uh, where's Sky Ranger Delta? It looks like our algorithm has changed again. Uh, I can try copy and pasting it in the chat. Yeah, hold on. I'm going to try copy pasting this. Or are you doing it? Oh, it worked. Are we getting it? Oh, all right. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, can I have someone read verses uh, 25 through Takers? Uh, I guess I will. Go for it. Okay. Uh, now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. All right. Thank you, Altrex. That was wonderful. So, oh boy. Um, so these are these are some pretty serious verses here. We have... If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, and wife, and children, brothers, and sisters, yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Um, so, my first question for you guys tonight, then, is what does Jesus mean here by the word hate? Hating the sin. Hating the sin, okay. I guess when you say hating the sin, what are you referring to? Like the. Because when he says here, he says hates his own father, mother, wife, children, brother, and sister. Uh, I guess for me personally, I don't see where he's talking about sin here. Uh, I think it's backed up by the next, the next sentence, which is whoever does not bear his own cross, referring to. Uh, so taking the part where and even his own hating even his own life and then pairing that with the next verse which is who does not bear his own cross i would say implies that it's trying to people who see their life and just go oh well i am who i am who i am it's fine whatever whereas those who bear their own cross realizing like hey i have things that are wrong with me i hate that i hate the things that are wrong like, I hate the sin that's within my own life. And then I think that can then not devolve, um, filter to the other wife, children, brothers, and sisters, and that sort of thing. Okay, Maybe. so so you're saying that by having a hatred for sin, that... Okay, um, 
Hi, Scrab. I didn't even see you there. I just all of a sudden I saw your bright red feather here, and I was like, "Whoa!" I didn't even know you were in the chat. Um. So basically, what I'm hearing from you, Freedom, is that you feel like, or you're you're saying you're thinking that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but even though he's saying here that anyone that does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brother, and sister, ye, even ye, even his own life cannot be disciple. You're saying that equates to sin, because. What, what they're was the not other? they're not rejecting their life which okay. means they have some connection to their life still um and thereby they cannot be his disciple they're not reject okay so okay so when you say they're not rejecting your life you're talking about when he's the people who say they want to follow christ they're not rejecting yeah. their life and therefore they okay all right i see that um and then kessa has a bible hub oh she puts the greek up there Messier. That's interesting that it says Messier because when I was looking it up in concordance, it was Messio. Yep, it's Messio. Messio. So, um, I don't know. I'm guessing that that's. I'm not familiar with Greek syntax, but that seems like it's just a matter of tense. Okay. So, the word for here is. Uh, that's the one, Cass. The word I had here is Messio, which it probably is just a, you know like what Scribe said, which it means to detest, especially to persecute or by extension to love less or to hate. I think that last that last little bit to love less is really kind of the vital understanding here. And I would agree with you too, Scribe. At least that's how I was looking at it. But then one of the things that struck out to me is when I started looking at all these verses that it's used throughout scripture, like all the ones that Kessa has pictured right there. It, uh -huh. uh, well, let me just read some of them to you because it doesn't sound like love less. It sounds like straight up uh, hatred and persecution. So like, for <laughs> example, Matthew 5.43 says, you, you have heard that it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. Matthew 5 verses 44 it said, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for those that... that which despitefully use you and persecute you. And then Matthew 6, 24, you know, no one can serve two masters. either will hate one and love the other. Uh, Matthew 24, 10. And then which I think that one. you can also say love less for that one. That's but true. Carry on. Yep. Yep. You could say that one. Matthew 24 verses 10. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Luke one, chapter one, verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies from the hands of all who hate us. Luke 6.22, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on the account of Son of Man. Okay. Um, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just waiting because I, I, I have the trump card. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Yeah. I, I'm All just right. letting you go because you're on a roll. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, please butt in because yet, like you did point out, the one uh, about serving God or mammon or God and money. That is so, yeah. So here's my question. Okay. What's the th what's the thing that I constantly say in here, all the time? The Bible's the best commentary on itself. Yeah, exactly. So if we're gonna read this statement talking about hating our father and our mother and even our own lives, then how does that compare with the rest of Scripture? Primarily, you know, if we go a couple, you know, a couple books over to some of the Pauline epistles where it tells us to honor our father and mother and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, how does that line up? That's actually the the whole point of why this study was so hard for me because I actually, mm -hmm. in my entire outline, I've got listed different things here. And I even uh, read a bunch of different pastors' commentary on it. And one of the pastors' commentaries said what Farmer Gale said here. Uh, he loved him so much more, like Farmer Gale says right here, love him so much more than our love for our family so that our love is like hatred in comparison. Which so, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Nope. Um, the, the reason, so when I read that, the reason I had a hard time swallowing that is because it specifically mentions also like wife in there. And then if we look in Ephesians or even children, and if you look at Ephesians, it says husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Mm -hmm. Which if Christ loved the church so much that he paid, it, like he died on the cross for our sins, the ultimate sacrifice. Mm -hmm. How in the world are you supposed to love your wife like that? And yet 
if it's the ultimate, you know what I'm saying? Like if it's the ultimate sacrifice. Okay. Let's put this in another context. Okay. What if what Jesus is highlighting here isn't necessarily a comparison of, okay. A, a talking about a direct love here. What if what he's doing is drawing uh, an analogy of priority? Okay. Yeah. What if what if your primary love should be so much higher? We are called to follow Christ. That is our aim in life. That is the reason that we exist is to be in communion with our Creator. And there is nothing else. And stop me if somebody else if somebody disagrees with this. Um, that there is nothing else in this earth that will satisfy that need to have communion with God, our Creator, and our Savior. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Who's okay. God. Okay, cool. So, so far we're good. So in that, that should be a, such a uh, massive component, our devotion to our lives to deviate from that in any way would be, uh, would be an error. Every, you know, this is why Paul talks about in all that we do in word or deed or whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, this is the goal, that every pursuit, every action we take is to be in pursuit of our Savior, of our God. To deviate from that, to say, oh, no, I, want, I will deviate from pursuing my Savior in favor of my mother or my father or my whomever is a problem. Right. I would agree with that. Okay. So I think that's what Jesus is really saying. It's not, and that comes back to the idea of loving less. The love that is devoted here is a love of pursuit. Okay. Yep. I would agree with that. So oh. going, going after Christ would be the great thing. And to sacrifice that pursuit for something else you know, and there's a reason that Jesus talks about the idea of, you know, bearing your cross. The only reason you bear a cross is what? Usually it's uh, to be, to be, to be killed. Exactly. You bear a cross because you're going to get crucified on it. Yeah. And so that is the denial of self, what I want for the sake of the Savior who now owns me. Right. I have no rights of my own. My rights I forfeit, I sacrifice, I kill on the cross that I bear in order to pursue Christ. But that does not, but we are also told that in the pursuit of Christ, we are given all these other commandments, you know, all these other things we are to do, to like honor our father and mother and to love our neighbors. And so everything within that has to be taken into the concept of I pursuing Christ, but as I pursue Christ, he is given me not only the right, but also the responsibility to perform these acts of love for those around me as well. Right. And so we can't, we can't throw the baby out with the bad water. We can't say, well, Jesus says hate here. No, we, we've, we've got to, we, we got to cover our bases here, guys. <laughs> right. John, you um, yeah. I'm, 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 that call to I'm, start. Oh, go I'm ahead. doing later. Oh, I'll track your bleeding a little buddy. Altrax, were you saying something? No. Oh, okay. okay. I just didn't want to interrupt. Um, before we get before we carry on, I wanted to also pay attention because I couldn't quite understand uh, Phoenix Flyer's comment right here. He says, other people not in our family, if we have, and then he says, if we have problems at all with anyone, then he says, Jesus might be being sarcastic by saying, you don't need me if you're perfect, but if you realize you don't have everything incomplete, and you are imperfect, then you may follow Jesus. Um, I guess, did you want to clarify any more on that, Phoenix? Or because in, in my in my view, and then from my earthly perspective, like I said, I want the Bible to shape my thoughts. I do not want the culture around me to shape my thoughts. I want the Bible to shape my thoughts. So I had a very hard time with this. Um, trying to see this from Jesus's point of view. But it seems like to me, like Phoenix here talks about Jesus being sarcastic. It seems like to me, Jesus here is being extreme. And I think another example of Jesus being ext extreme here 
is when Jesus talks about if your hand causes you to sin or, you know, cut it off. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out for it's better to, you know, to enter life with being maimed or crippled than to have the whole body cast into hell. But then since we're all sinners, why is it then that when we go to church on Sunday morning, there's not a bunch of people with missing hands and missing eyes? You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I guess, um, I guess that, that, that was one of the things, that was one of the only ways that I could figure out how to do with that. But then again, like Scribe was saying, he talked about, he put an emphasis on love less in which we're able to love others by simply as long as we notice that our ultimate sense of satisfaction is into following Christ and that through following Christ, we can, at least that's what I think you were trying to say, Scribe. Maybe I'm misquoting you, but by keeping, by keeping Christ first, the other things in scripture like honor your father and mother, husbands love your wives, you know, the Ephesians that talks about children, um, Duh. that is all something that is like an outflow of just our absolute devotion to Christ and Christ alone. Is that kind of what you're getting at, or am I missing what you were trying to say? I'm going to do a thing real quick. Go for it. So, While he's doing a thing, do you mind if I chime in on the, uh, I would, on the hand? I would love that for you. So my understanding of cutting off the hand is it is literal, but has your hand ever caused you to sin? Does the hand have a brain? Does the hand do anything without your permission? So the, and the eyes as well, the eyes do not cause you to sin. It's, it's your mind. It's the things that you focus on. You need to cut those focuses out of your, out of your mind, basically. Like if you know, looking at something would lead you to sin, stop, separate yourself from that and, and cut that out of your life. All right. Yeah, that makes so, sense. I think it's just, a good application. Sorry, I, I've heard the the argue, that comment before of well, why is there no <laughs> no one in church with missing hands and eyes and stuff? And it's just can I um, expand on something? Yeah, go for it. Um, this is something that's been on my mind for a while. Um, um, a little bit ago, um, like I remember um, the chosen episode. Uh, you can see that. Uh, Peter has a wife, um, but I never really um, saw that in scripture. I mean, it never uh, stuck in my memory. But um, so I was reading in Mark uh, not too long ago, and this isn't going to be news for most of you, but it's uh, Peter uh, chapter Mark chapter two, or no, Mark chapter one, verse twenty nine. It says, "Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John." So, uh, uh, but Simon's wife, mother, uh, so his wife's mother lay sick with a fever and they told him about her at once. So Jesus, that's Jesus. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up and immediately the fever left her and she served them. But uh, I guess what I'm trying to bring up here is, uh, let me see. Um, yes, uh, you know, Jesus, uh, and, uh, in the earlier verses here, we can see that he, uh, he picked up Simon and Andrew. Uh, he asked them to follow him, and they immediately followed him. And then uh, he does the same with uh, James and John, his brother. But later here, we read about him, uh, them uh, visiting. Uh, uh, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew. Uh, and the thing that's saying to me is um, Peter and Andrew were very faithful. They immediately followed Jesus. But their family was still somehow in some way uh still um a part of it i mean because they they were visiting their their house i mean not too i mean in the same chapter later and uh later we can read uh there's moments where uh what is it uh what is it john and andrews while mother uh later at least near the end of the book we can we can see that his mother approaches with them kind of asking them uh asking jesus about where they are going to be seated i think is right hand or left hand or something mm -hmm. so i just yeah. wanted to bring up how uh, family uh, is, is uh, the, the disciples. Their family. Is, is, there's parts of of, of, of the uh, of the of these uh, chat books where they uh, you can see their family. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I appreciate you bringing that to light. It's true. It's something that oftentimes when we think of Jesus and the disciples, you just kind of see picture Jesus in the wilderness with the disciples around him. But and there's so much emphasis on that. But you're absolutely right about how there are times we see the family that they they are there and they do show up and they are particip- they are participating. Um, yeah, that's cool. Uh, it's amazing was... to me how you get such discussion out of this wise rat. <laughs> oh, it's it's not me. It's you guys. You guys and your input. I really was nervous tonight about discussing this because this is hard for me. And I do have, I did have an application which I'm saving towards the end that I was able to glean from it. But I really appreciate everything that you guys have been uh, putting in. Um, this is what I wanted. I wanted to bring this before. Uh, the church, you guys, other believers and other Christians. Um, let me see here. So we got Kessa has a question here. It says, what circumstances would require one to choose between God and other intimate connections? Since Ephesians and other writings make it clear that God is in favor of us of having those close connections. And then there are plenty of people who del- delight to hate everyone around them and claim it was a holy life. Yes, and the reason why that that's, sticks out to me is because as a, since I grew up in a Wesleyan church, one of the things that we did as, a, as kids is we read the biography of John Wesley, and man, he really like abandoned his wife. Like he basically just, he, he started a church denomination, but he was a terrible husband. Like he just kind of just left them and, you know, but, and that was just one thing that stuck out to me as a kid, you know, and so that's what I think that's, I think that's one of those mental hangups that I am trying to figure out how to like get over, but let's see what else we got here. Uh, listed for you. Uh, first John four, seven through eight, God is love beloved. Let us love one another for love is of God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And that's, I mean, it's a very popular verse. And it's a verse that I constantly remind myself with. Mm-hmm. Uh, was it I think it's kind of I think it's very much the just putting kind of I, I just wanted to you know make it very clear the whole idea of putting this idea of hatred to rest right I think it's all I'm really wanting to put that there right and I will and I will put a yeah, I absolutely agree with you I guess I'm just um well, I'm going to continue to read the comments, but I do have something to segue into to get us off of that that word. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, and that's fair. We've probably spent too much time on it, anyways. Um, so Kessa says here, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. At the moment, he's popular, and he perceives that the reason is the benefits they see themselves getting with him: healing, food, miracles, reflecting reflected glory. I think he's ripping off the illusion and warning people that truly sincerely following him is going to awaken hatred and evil f- from their intimates that they never dreamed existed count the cost now he says because you are going to have to decide and that is exactly the segue that i was wanting to lead into here with the whole i topic. swear she's got she's got I cameras that was, that I, was did, did, I was trying because okay i was going to save this towards the end but since she's already brought it up um when I was studying this, I did call my dad. And one of the things that he said to me that, because that really did stick out to me, is he said, Aaron, I think you're spinning. Because, you know, when I started this Bible study, the first thing I did is, oh my goodness, why does he say the word hate? And then I start researching hate. So then I get discouraged and I call my dad. And he's like, why are you f- focusing so much on the word hate? And he said, I, he, or he, what he said is, he said, I wouldn't s- spend so much time focusing on the word hate, but look at what the passage is talking about here. So, um, Sean, if you could bring up Luke, uh, I think it's fourteen twenty-eight. Uh, uh yeah, twenty-eight through thirty. Yeah, so here in twenty-eight through thirty, it says, "For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost." whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. 
so what we see here is like Kessa was talking about here. There's a lot of people following Jesus for reasons like, well, reasons that she just men mentioned. I don't need to necessarily repeat it. But one of the things that kept coming up to me as I read this passage and read this passage and studying it is this is when you look about what this is, this is about the cost of discipleship. This is like we use the term and I'm, and I'm going to steal one of the points that my dad brought up, but we use the term a lot of accepting Christ, you know, asking Jesus to be, uh, you know, to come into our life. You know, we, we talk about accepting Jesus as your savior and stuff like that. Acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. We use that word a lot. And I don't think it really captures what you're doing when we approach, when we, ask Jesus to be Lord of our life when we make him Lord of our life. It, the word acceptance, I think has a, is too weak of a word. And I think what Jesus is basically saying here is like, listen, if you are going to be my disciple, you have to renounce everything. And I think with that comes in the, the benefits that the apostle Paul talks about, like in Ephesians about being able to love your wife, like Christ loves the church about honoring your father and mother, like Moses commanded in Exodus. I think a lot of that is outflow of that. Um, let's see here. I've been talking a lot and the comments are rolling. Let's go back to the comments here. You can skip over most of them. <laughs> let's see. A little bit of an essay snark. <laughs> uh, sarcastic wasn't the comment I should have used he's being serious and simple if you're a perfect person you don't need jesus you need to admit you're not perfect to follow jesus hating those around you is a problem if you don't have any problems then you are perfect and you don't need jesus and a perfect person we know a perfect person does not exist um, and if you think you're perfect you most definitely need jesus um that's my own take on that comment uh bob says here I I R C. I don't actually know what that means, Bob. I'm sorry. There was some passage from Paul where he talks about the advantages of preachers being single. Yeah, he does talk about that. I've heard I've re I've heard some discussion on that topic as well. Did you want to write anything, or did you want to expound any more upon that, Bob, or you just wanted to throw that out there, just to throw it out there? Uh, all right, let's move on. Let's see, Kessa Post in 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is a worse than an unbeliever. That is the verse I remind myself every time I don't feel like going to work in the morning. I wake up and I'm like, ah, uh, I just want to lay in bed. Too bad Mr. Wesley didn't have that verse memorized. I know. <laughs> That's, that, is, that is a verse I live by right there for sure. Um, and Scribe says, where are the cameras? Kessa? Freedom, Kessa yeah, welcome to the part you can skip. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Luke 14, 20 through 30. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not... You post it. His wise rat posted that. <laughs> okay. And then Kess. Thank you for back on tracking us, Miss Wise Rat. <laughs> so the if I remember correctly, that's what IIRC stands for. <laughs> AJ would say it's recall, and I'm going to throw him under a bus. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Kessa posts here, what he says even on his knees about his own sinfulness is all parrot talk. At bottom, he still believes he has run up a very favorable credit balance in the enemy's ledger by allowing himself to be converted from the screw tape letters. So I know that the C.S. Lewis' of screw tape letters is about a conversation between uh, like a master demon and a slave demon. But yes, I don't more or know, less, yeah. I don't actually know what the context of this of this uh, sentence is or what, what Kessa, Kessa, what do you... What brought this to mind? Um, you were talking about accepting Christ, like, oh, I'll allow myself to be converted. Isn't that nice of me? God owes me a lot. Okay. All right. Yep. Awesome. 
All right. Well, I'm scrolling through my notes here because we actually, because we've already forsaken the word hate and moved on to the cost of discipleship, that cut out a lot of my questions, like honoring your father and mother. We already talked about that. Um, Maybe I oh, gosh. There's a thorny <laughs> one. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, Scrab. I didn't hear what you said. I said maybe I work for the NSA. <laughs> oh, that hurt. <laughs> um. So moving on. Um. Okay. Here's another. Here's another word we can focus on that doesn't involve the word hate. Um. Bearing one's own cross. So if we're saved through faith, how is bearing one's cross not considered you know because you know in romans it talks about we're safe through faith not through works but then is bearing one's own cross is that faith or is that works <laughs> any comments guys you're adorable <laughs> are you talking to Cass or are you talking to me i'm talking to you <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, gosh. Talking to James, you know, faith and works. And he's like, is this faith or works? Anybody that's read James, they'll do the same thing. <laughs> well, I agree with you. Do you want to expand <laughs> upon it? Would you like to? <laughs> You're doing great. I'm just being a troll. It's wonderful. <laughs> So, uh, except the only problem is Scraggy is not a teenager. You you are correct. Yes. I am not. <laughs> no, I'm very not. It, 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 in spite he's of in spite of my behavior, yes, he is. <laughs> he's a teenager at heart. That that, that <laughs> is a, that is like potently true. My gosh. <laughs> so, <laughs> act your age. I'll, I'll take it. Why is that? So. Faith that doesn't evidence itself in outward actions and deci the decisions is dead. It, your faith has to mean something. Faith is the substance of things not seen. It's not the substance of nothing. So yeah. when life is going well and your faith isn't being crossed by circumstances or other people, it's, it tends to be invisible, so to speak, like anyone would do well in those circumstances. But when things are going badly... And one has to decide whether or not to take up that cross. That's when, like, you know, a boat on a current, our lives move in one direction or another. Either we move um, with the current of faith that carries us or, you know, we pick a quieter path, an easier path that doesn't require us to exercise our faith. You know, the faith we maybe haven't got. Right. This sounds strangely. I've familiar. always heard it like this. It's, yes, it's kind of like James. It's works or Hebrews. because of your faith, <laughs> not because of your work. Sounds like Sunday, Cass. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've forgotten about that. Feels like a month ago. Well, I think, I think, and to Cass's credit, I think she paraphrased James. Well, sometimes some of it didn't even sound like paraphrasing. Some of it sounded like direct quoting. But I thought you did a beautiful job ex uh, summarizing James when it talks about the faith versus works and how what works without or faith without works is dead. So thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. I did it with mosquitoes chasing me too. Then, uh, Why are there mosquitoes in October? Because that's what happens when you live on the West Coast, right? It's 90 degrees today. <laughs> All right. Let me look back over here. So... Even though we didn't really go deep into the actual word of bearing ones on the cross, the word bear here in Greek is bestazo, and it means literally to lift up. It can also figuratively mean, though, to endure, to declare, to sustain, and to receive. So those all apply to what we've been talking about. Those are all good traits to have. Endurance, declaration, sustaining, and receiving. Um... And if that's someone looking up in the concordance, it's uh, that pages I hear turning. It's uh, no, no, no that, that that's me turning pages in my Bible. I was still in First John. <laughs> okay. Oh, did you want to read something from First John? 
No, that was that was the first John first four seven eight that I posted up earlier. Okay. I forgot I hadn't gone back to Luke fourteen. That's right. I have a physical Bible. <laughs> All right. Well, let's. Uh, I still have some more stuff to read here. Let's actually look at. I know we've. I know we've already touched on this a lot, actually. But let's go ahead and let's read Luke. 14 verses 31 through 33. Can you post that up, Luciana, so we can read it? I've been talking way too much tonight. I'll go ahead and read something or speak something profitable. <laughs> go for it. All right. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Comments? Anything that stands out to you? Um, the word renounce, comparing it maybe to the word hate sure. earlier <laughs> in the... Uh, uh, paraphrase all of this it's just count the cost <laughs> probably heard that if you've ever sat in a church service before <laughs> right oh, i'm praying for wisdom um so like we've already talked about notice that jesus talks about counting the cost i really believe that this and i really do believe this is the heart and soul of the passage um You know what? Everything that I have, <laughs> everything I have written in my notes about this passage, we've already covered. So now I'm kind of like thumbing through here, being like, "Oh man." Um, <laughs> well, you don't have any more not time. helpful, Phoenix. <laughs> What if you say take more notes then? Yeah, I should. Um, I just finished reading through all my notes on this verse, and we've already covered all of it. So I guess if you guys have nothing else to put on to go along with this, anything that else doesn't stand out to you, because it's basically the same idea of counting the cost. You have a, a king who's preparing to go to battle against another king, and then he decides, like in this analogy, I mean, he basically decides. Uh, whether it'd be better off just to send a delegation out and ask for terms of peace. Uh, Kessa says another way of asking the same thing is, is it worth it? Yes. That's a perfect analogy right there. Very simple. I've heard it said that intelligence is to be able to take something that's complex and simplify it. So I think Kessa is very intelligent because it's a very simple way to put it. Um, I guess since that all the everything I had written my notes about this has already been covered, we'll go ahead and we'll move on to the last part of this section, which is Luke 14 verses 34 through 35. Um, anyone like to read that? And this will wrap up the chapter for Luke 14. I can read it. I will. Do it I, I can oh, okay. try my my. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. It, it's... Who? Oh, sorry, I didn't. Okay, fine. I'll read it before I get dropped. Um, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So, what crosses your mind when you hear these verses? What is? What do you think this is even about? I know we talk a lot about salt, and we've talked a lot about salt before. 
and it makes Bob hungry. So the Italian word for salt is salar. I know that because I, I went on a trip to Italy and I learned a few words before I went. And it's the root word for our word salary. And the reason for that is that the Roman soldiers were actually paid with salt. Salar. Okay. Salary. That is because it was that valuable. And I believe the ancient form of salt was uh, not nearly as pure as what we have now. So a lump of salt or salty earth is its saltiness. And then it wasn't good. Useful. I'm just reading these comments here. Um, Javiswood said, some cultures use salt as representing purity. And Aja says, oh, I thought you were saying celery. I got confused. No. I, 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 at first, when she first said it, I thought it was celery too, and then it, and then it made sense. So. Um. I'll go ahead and just read the ver when I read this, there was a verse that popped into my mind. And if you don't think that these correlate in any way, let then I'd like to hear your explanation. But as for me, when I read this, this was the other verse that popped in my mind. And this is from uh, uh, Revelation and Revelation chapter three, verses 15 through 16. And it's when the son of man, John's having a vision and the son of man is talking to uh, the church of, what church was it? Was it Ephesus? I can't remember now. Let me look it up real quick. That'd be the one that lost their first love. Yes, Revelation 3. 3? Ephesus was like chapter 2, I'm pretty sure. Oh, it's I think it was the very first one. <laughs> How do I, I got the wrong reference written here. Guys, brace yourselves. He just went to the book of Revelation. Oh, okay. We're no. all getting down. Like, we, we, we. Like, uh, <laughs> like, okay, here he goes. I don't know why I didn't put the church down here, but the Son of Man's talking, and John's having this vision, and the Son of Man is just talking to the church of Laodicea. And he says, oh. And he says, I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you... Let's see. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'll spit you from my mouth. For I say, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. That was a word that stuck out to me, being refined by fire. So that you may be rich and white garments, so that you may, be, so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and the salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. And this also stood out to me. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous and repent. So when we talk, so maybe I'm off basis here, but when I hear him talking here about the salt losing its saltiness, the thing that went through my mind was the word lukewarm. Um, I don't know. Do you guys, what are your guys' thoughts? See, Kessa puts here, said, maybe it's hard to tell by merely looking at the salt whether it is still salty, but if it goes into the pot, so to speak, you quickly find out whether it flavors the food. So if we're the salt of the earth, but under, but under boil turn out to be just dirt, we're not improving anything about our lives or the lives of others. I would absolutely agree with that. Anything else, guys? Phoenix, uh, I don't think the world is a meaty stew. No, keep reading. And Kessa says, you heard it here, folks. Be salty. <laughs> uh, yes, on Discord, we are encouraging you to be salty. 
Hi, YouTube. <laughs> Please, YouTube. Please. <laughs> All right. Well, I really appreciate everyone's input tonight. I really do. Is there any other questions or comments or concerns that you guys have before we uh, start going to prayer? Because that, that wraps up Luke 14. So we're going to be jumping into the next chapter, 15, next Bible study. So. Look at all the parables. <laughs> Tony, this is faith. The average YouTuber comment section must be very faithful indeed. That's so funny, Bob. Um, all right. If no one has anything else to add, then I guess we can... Go to prayer. Uh, football. Let me. I gotta text football real quick. Uh, can I just te text it here, or if he, or does he need to see it stop recording? You can also just play? move the recording out of channel. Okay. If yeah, you have moved ours. I have. No. Oh. Yeah. I guess none of us do. Yeah. Right.